welcome everybody. Welcome everybody to this exciting session. Thank you and welcome to the Google Moogle tent. My name is Laura McDonald. We're very excited to have you here and we have a wonderful panelist of esteemed authors um, to discuss the art of the short story. Um, I'd now like to throw to our moderator, um, if I could, Anjum Hassan, if you wouldn't mind introducing the wonderful authors that we have with us. I hope you, that you enjoy the session. Please, phones on silent, no flash photography. If you really need to make, have a conversation, please just take it out there um, and enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm back here on, in the uh, Mughal tent and talking this time about the art of the short story. And uh, it's curious because in India we often hear the short story is in danger, the short story is dying, no one reads the short story, no one publishes the short story. And as we continue saying this, uh, we keep uh, encountering more and more new writers of the short story, more and more collections, more and more anthologies. So there's a curious paradox. Is the short story still alive? Do people still read it? Do we still care? Uh, there doesn't seem to be a clear answer to that question, but all of us here are writers of the short story and admirers of the short story form. I'm going to start with Yi Yoon Lee. Uh, Yi Yoon is a celebrated writer of the short story. Her first collection of short stories, A Thousand Years of Good Prayers, won uh, what's probably the most prestigious short story collection award in the world, the Frank O'Connor Short Story Award. Uh, and her second collection, um, uh, is, uh, is the one that we're going to talk about a little bit today because that's the one that's available in India and that's also a collection of short stories and it was also shortlisted for the Franco Corner Award. Um, Yi Yun uh, grew up in China and then moved to Iowa to study immunology. Uh, but then she got very inspired by the literary scene in Iowa City and decided to become a writer and she's a marvelous writer. Uh, I've, I've been enjoying um, her second book of stories hugely. Uh, what struck me, Yoon, about the stories in that book is that uh, they're all very sad stories. <laughs> and I'm sure you've heard this a lot. Uh, they are melancholy stories. But what is, uh, what is interesting about the melancholy of these characters is that um, they all live in, envi in environments, in circumstances that are pretty regulated, where ideas of happiness are pretty conventional ideas of happiness. Happiness within marriage, happiness uh, in parental and children relationships, happiness in careers. And to me, it seemed like the characters in your stories, by uh, choosing to be unhappy, despite, uh, you know, they could, they could, they could sort of uh, seek solutions to their unhappiness, but they sort of resist that, uh, their unhappiness becomes a kind of individualism. You know, so unhappiness, sadness, loneliness, sol solitariness as a way of, of establishing your uniqueness, your individuality. Would you like to respond to that? Yes. Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. You know, it's, it's very interesting you said it's sad stories. I, I do get that comment all the time. And, and I, often, I often come back and say, you know, tell me one person who's not sad or who doesn't have a sad story. And in a way, I think, you know, when we talk about sadness, it's really, we're talking about something underneath the surface. You know, we can all put on a happy face where we can put on performance, but I think, you know, short stories, I mean, fiction in general is dealing with things underneath. And so I think sadness, or I, to me, it's more about solitude and loneliness of these characters, and oftentimes, that it's their only way to protest about their life. And they're not very loud protesters, but they, they do protest all the same. Okay. Um, I'm going to come back to you, uh, Yoon, and talk a little bit more about the stories in, in, in uh, Gold Boy and Emerald Girl. But uh, I thought we would just talk a little bit about each of our stories first and then come back to the more general questions about the art of the short story. Uh, Richard Beard is a novelist and a short story writer. He's published five novels. And uh, Richard is quite an experimental writer. Um, one of his novels, Damascus, is set uh, on, a, on a single day in 1963. 
And all the nouns used in the book are from the edition of Times from that day, from that day in 1963. Uh, he's also written um, a novel called Lazarus is Dead, which I believe combines fiction with commentary. So it's a sort of a meta novel where you have fiction as well as commentary. Uh, but we're going to talk about Richard's short stories today. And uh, after the session, if you'd like to, you could go and read some of them on his website. Uh, Richard is also the director of the National Academy of Writing. So I think he's, he's probably bombarded with short stories on a daily basis. Uh, but I'd like, to, before we, we go on to the craft of uh, short story writing, I'd like to ask him about a story he's written called uh, James Joyce ELT Teacher. Is that right? James Joyce EFL Teacher. Sorry. <laughs> James Joyce EFL Teacher. Uh, EFL being English as a foreign language. Now, this is a story about a man in, an English man in Japan teaching English as a foreign language. Uh, a very sincere teacher of English as a foreign language, but also unhappy in some, way because, some ways because he would rather be a writer. And his model is James Joyce, who apparently taught English for a living in Europe while writing his novels. And our character in the story um, aspires to be a novelist, but for the time being is just correcting Finnegan's Wake. He thinks Finnegan's Wake is full of, is full of grammatical errors and bad writing. He spends his time correcting it. Uh, what struck me about, uh, uh, about the James Joyce story, Richard, is that it is a story about wanting to write. And it's, so in some ways, it's a story that hasn't started. It will start when your character actually starts writing. And he also has this uh, crush on his young student, young Japanese student. And he's not sure if uh, it would be right for him to be attracted to her and to consummate that, that affection and that crush. So it's a story which seemed to me sort of in suspension. And I wondered if that was deliberate and that was a formal choice or it was just the subject? Well, I think all uh, aspiring writers have to think about what they're going to do while they're writing uh, at the beginning. And uh, teaching English as a foreign language is a very popular choice. You get to go to exotic places, meet interesting people. Um, and of course, James Joyce did it, which a lot of writers think is a fantastic um, way into writing. If he could do it um, and write the books he did, then a lot of aspiring writers think, well, I'll do teaching. English as a foreign language. But the more this character looks at the way Joyce taught, uh, the more it becomes clear that if you want to be a good writer, you have to be a very bad teacher of English as a foreign language. Um, and Joyce famously, well, not only did he um, not have many clothes to wear, he only had one suit when he was a teacher. Uh, and he used to smoke all the time. He used to burst into song was one of his tricks while he was teaching. Sometimes he wouldn't turn up because he was drunk. Um, and uh, he also did fall in love with a 14-year-old girl who he was teaching. So he wasn't really a good recommendation for English teachers. Uh, and the worst thing, therefore, to be, if you want to be a writer, is an efficient and effective teacher of English as a foreign language. And that really is the dilemma, I think, for many aspiring writers who might start with short stories, uh, is that you almost feel if you want to be a good writer, you have to be bad at other things. Um, and that's partly what the story is about. It is possible to be good at more than one thing, obviously, but that is the starting out dilemma that this story partly tries to explore. Okay. Um, Nicholas Hogg is also a novelist and uh, a short story writer. All three of them are actually novelists and short story writers, so uh, there's a bit of competition. And is there a bit of schizophrenia as well, Nicholas? Um, I. I if in an ideal world, I would make my living from short stories. Oh, that's, I'm glad in, to hear you say that. Yes. Uh, because uh, short story is often treated as the poor cousin of the novel. But uh, Nicholas, we were just talking before the session started, and uh, Nicholas said that his short stories are often based on reality. They're things that really happen to him, and they're like doc documentary pieces which he talks about as short stories, and he publishes as short stories, but they actually really happened. And he's written a very moving story about a young man in America who goes to California to help an old Vietnamese woman transcribe Vietnamese folk tales, and she lives alone. Uh, her husband is dead, her children are grown up, and they've left. And she has memories of the, of the war in Vietnam. Uh, and what she wants for the world to hear are these Vietnamese folk tales, and the name of the story is How the Tiger Got Its Stripes. Uh, and I thought it was a very moving story because 
At the end of the story, she says, uh, America is a very young country. It's a couple of hundred years old. Vietnam is much older, and we are the wiser culture, and you need to hear our stories. Uh, and in between this narrative of this young man and this older woman, uh, Nicholas actually gives us the story of how the tiger got its stripes. Do you think that's true, Nicholas, that the West is a newer culture and uh, they don't really have the stories that matter? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's, a, that's a lovely intro question. <laughs> um, I should try and dodge that, really. Um, but it, it was easy to... I mean, I've read... I think we were chatting before about... I was chatting to a journalist here. That One of the, one of the first kind of story adventures I had was the Hanuman story. Uh, Rama and... Shiva, Sita? Rama and Sita. Rama and Sita. And this... So folk tales have always been a, a, a huge part of my reading. And of course, we can get knowledge from folk tales and fables, but that, I think that particular story was more of actually a personal story about a relationship with the Vietnamese lady and her personal history and things that perhaps I couldn't express. I mean, I thought she was, she's an incredibly strong woman. She's the life she's lived is uh, profound. It makes our life look like a pantomime, just the things she's been through. And there was a certain sadness of, she had three husbands, two who committed suicide. She's got these sons who are married and, and, and flown her nest. Um, and it's, it's a way of holding on to something you've experienced and, and forging a memory from it and perhaps righting a wrong, something that you didn't achieve, a regret that you have, and, and changing it, perhaps. Um. Would, would you like to respond to this idea of uh, fiction that's based on the truth? Because at least in India now, we, we have a lot of fiction being published and read, but there's also this feeling that the best stories are the true life ones, and the most exciting writing is non-fiction. Uh, so how do you fight for a space for fiction that is different from non-fiction, and how do you uh, create a sense of fiction's uniqueness? How do you do that? Uh, if you're actually using things from real life. What makes fiction different? What makes it special? I, this is a question I'm asking myself because recently I've written a few non-fiction pieces and I've really enjoyed working in a, in a poetic, artistic way on non-fiction. Mm -hmm. And they are very similar. They're very, very similar. Whether one, this is what happened, this is not mm. what didn't happen. Mm. Uh, I think James Frey, a Million Little mm. Pieces is, is a perfect example. He couldn't sell this as a work of fiction, but when it was a memoir, then authors took it. But as soon as he was found out on the Oprah Winfrey show that he'd, he'd embellished huge parts of it, it somehow made it redundant. But the prose is still fantastic. The story is still fantastic. But for some reason, readers were not willing to accept it when it was fiction. I think that's really unfortunate. You, you, do you ever feel the pressure uh, writing your stories that readers might read it as a document of how life is in China or how life is for Chinese Americans? Do you ever feel that anxiety that it may be taken as ethnography rather than fiction? Right. No, I, I think it's very fortunate for me that I actually don't have these pressures. Or I don't feel these anxieties because well, in a way, I, you know, I come into writing to write for, you know, I mean, we always say we write for the ideal readers. I mean, my ideal readers would not be the readers who come to my fiction to see how exotic or, you know, how interesting or how charming Chinese culture is or how terrible Chinese history is. So, I mean, I exclude these readers in my mind, so I don't have that pressure or I don't have the anxiety. And I also don't feel, you know, I don't feel I represent anyone but myself. So, if you you know you come, I, I think it it happens when you write in a in, in write a, about another culture. For instance, in America, people would or you know in the West or they would take it as you know a representative. But I think that's the reader's responsibility. That's not my responsibility. They have to overcome their reading to meet me somewhere rather than. I have to say, oh, this is not, you know, you, you're, you're misreading me. No, it's not my responsibility. Okay, uh, Richard, continuing on this theme of uh, what makes fiction special? What does, what does fiction do that no other form can? 
And uh, in keeping with the theme of the session, what can the short story do that no other form can do? Uh, and I'm thinking here of a wonderful little book on the art of the short story called The Lonely Voice uh, by the Irish writer Frank O'Connor. Mm -hmm. And this is a classic study of the short story. Uh, and Frank O'Connor argues that um, the short story, starting from Chekhov, uh, heralded the arrival of what he calls the little man, the Chekhovian little man. And his argument is that the short story, more than any other genre, allows you to write about what he calls submerged population groups, by which he means people not part of the mainstream, people marginalized, people in the periphery, uh, people who uh, maybe not so well to do both in economic terms and also spiritually, who are sort of on the fringes. Uh, and that's O'Connor's thesis in this book, uh, that the little man, the marginal figure, is sort of lends itself superbly to the short story. Richard, would you agree with that? Uh, not really, um, <laughs> because it would be a bit of a shame if the little man could only have a little story. Mm. Um, I think mm. if you're going to want to fully express and communicate the voice of the little men, as you say, I mean, you can write novels about that as well. Mm. I don't mm. think there should be a feeling that if someone has what's perceived as a small life, that you can therefore only write short stories mm. about them. That would be a weakness uh, of the form rather than a strength. Um, I think one of the uh, advantages of the short story form is the ability to experiment. Uh, if writers like to experiment, the short story is an obvious place where you can do that um, and try things out for the first time and achieve them at a shorter, um, in a shorter space than, than a novel. You don't need to sustain experiments for a long time. Um, I think it's also very useful, uh, the short stories are useful spaces for novelists to use up stuff that they couldn't get into the novels, which is something which is not often enough said, um, is that there's really good stuff, doesn't fit into the structure of a novel, it will make a nice story. Um, clearly in fiction, one of the advantages of fiction over non-fiction is the nuance that it allows. You can be, explore all sorts of questions and problems with the nuance which in non-fiction is sometimes difficult. But it is a place where you can meet the reader as well. Um, maybe one story where all this comes together I'd like to mention, where non-fiction, fiction, experimentalism and nuance all come together. It's a story uh, by George Preck, a French experimental writer, and it's called Everything I Ate and Drank in 1974. And it's simply a list of all the things he ate and drank in one year. But the reader has to meet this story by providing the context for, for example, the bottles of champagne that Perec drank in that year by providing the kind of celebrations where he might have drunk the champagne. Um, and it's a very good example of how an experimental fiction in short form can bring a reader um, and a writer together. He starts off from a non-fiction non writer's point of view, but the reader needs to bring a fictional mind to enjoy that story and to make that story uh, work. And I think that's the, the reader contribution. That's exactly what Yeon was talking about. And that's a great thing in the short story, which is, after all, a very good place for um, presenting new voices, as you say. Um, and uh, really, it's what you bring as the reader, which is where the advantage of fiction is. Uh, Richard, you're talking about the, uh, about the short story lending itself very well to experiment. Uh, and I think you've done a bit of that mm. in your short story called What's Not to Love. Uh, now, this is a short story that's written like a series of directions to a theatre director directing two people who are on the verge of having an extramarital affair. And they're not quite sure whether it's right to do it or whether they should step back and uh, uh, go their separate ways and never see each other again. But the whole story is a set of stage directions. Why did you write the story like that? Uh, well, the mechanics of it, the way the plot works, is you have the two, char the two characters who are considering committing adultery and they want to know how far you can go before it counts as adultery and clearly there's a kind of tension built into that because everyone will have their own opinion um, but I set it out as I did is because the subject of adultery in London is the classic or the classically mocked subject of genteel English fiction um, in particular experimental writers when they want to say what's wrong with English fiction will talk about um, the kind of fiction which presents adultery in London drawing rooms. So once I took that as a subject, I wrote, I wrote the play directions to start off because 
Uh, it is a theatrical thing to write about. You have the idea of people watching this from outside. Even the adulterers themselves have their partners, their absent partners, are, are part of the act that's going on. So it's a theatrical thing to do, to consider adultery. But in, as the story goes on, there are, also, uh, there are some parts which are presented as poetry because there are poetic elements in adultery. It then becomes, the stage directions then become the stage directions of a television soap opera, which is what all um, adulterous relationships eventually become, just a series of complications and accidents and comic mishaps. And finally, at the end, it becomes a tragedy because that's where these adulterous stories lead in the end. They start off with sadness embedded within them. All adulterous stories will end sadly for somebody who is involved. Um, and therefore, by going through the different forms, I hope to show uh, really the, this idea, this very old idea of a story subject, adultery in London drawing rooms, from as many different uh, formal perspectives as possible. Uh, why do you think so much Anglo-American fiction is about adultery? Why I, are there so many stories about sex outside marriage? Is it like you run out of subjects or...? No, I think it's mainly because writers have lots of time on their hands and therefore often um, are likely to be interested in, if not engaged in, adultery. That's why it's... Speak for yourself, Richard. I um, think, uh, <laughs> so this has nothing to do with London society or Western society. This is purely about it's Richard and writers like It's to do with writers, like writers yeah. Uh, okay. It's interesting, Richard, because uh, I read three of your stories and actually all of them, all three of them, uh, deal with the question of illicit sex in some way. <laughs> Um, was that, is that just you having a lot of time on your hands? Or? Well, <laughs> I have a very uh, vivid imagination, obviously, um, to try and imagine these things. Mm. Uh, it would be unusual, I think, not to uh, explore imaginatively these ideas of living other lives. An adulterer is one way of living another life or considering um, uh, adventures with people who are not your partner is a way of imagining other lives. It's a way that we live fictionally. We're all living fictions all the time. We're imagining other ways we can live. And one of the most direct ways we do that is by looking at other people in, in interested ways. Uh, and therefore, I like the way that crosses over fiction with a particular interest of mine, which is clearly sex. Okay. Uh, you'll have to read Rich's stories to get more of that. But I want to ask Nicholas... Uh, continuing this question about form and experiment with the short story, uh, he has a short story called Zen, which is about a young American Marine who's arrested in, in Tokyo. And we're never quite sure what for. But he meets a Yakuza in prison in Japan. A Yakuza is somebody from the Japanese mafia, mafia yeah. am I right? And the Yakuza teaches him how to look into himself and breathe and acquire a zen-like attitude to his imprisonment so that the, the time of the imprisonment becomes less uh, unbearable. What struck me about that story, Nicholas, is that the whole theme of the story is about expanding time uh, so that time moves slower and you're less frustrated by this empty time that you're spending in prison. And yet the form of the short story and the passage where you describe this is very, very snappy. So there seems to be a contradiction between themes which are about the expansion of time, like the one in your story, and the form of the short story, which by its nature sort of militates against anything very expansive. Uh, this is where I was very happy with that shory, story, to be honest, because it, it's, I came to short stories from reading poetry first. So Zen began its life as a poem, and then I expanded it into a short story. And this is what poetry does with time. Mm. It, it, it expands, they grow in you, they mm. stay with you. Mm. And it, but I think in Zen also the landscape helps. We're, we're in a prison, we're in a snowy uh, northeastern America. Mm. So part of the landscape enables the time to spread out in that way. And that particular story was a confluence of four different very true things. I had a friend who was arrested in Japan and put in prison. Um, I, had, I met a, a guy who'd left or tried to leave the Yakuza, who'd spent time in prison. I'd just started doing yoga, so there's a yoga aspect to this guy who's in prison. And the divorce part and where he's breaking up with his Japanese wife 
again, these are all four different aspects that just very blended quite naturally together. Sometimes it doesn't work when I try and bring real life examples into stories and you miss, it's too close or there's not enough time for you to properly digest something in your life and then write about it in an artistic way where it's not cathartic, it's not therapy on the page for yourself and the reader. Mm, 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 mm. Um, but it's interesting that your character in that story uh, is a very, again, a very solitary character who's, who's sort of it's, very, it's a very beautiful form because uh, he's driving his daughter to go and see some horses in a paddock and he's telling her the story about his time in Japan and of course she doesn't understand she's only three years old. So it's a, like a soliloquy but it's not because he's also talking to this little girl. And what struck me in your story, Zen, as well as in your other story um, uh, about the... V what, sorry, what was that story called? The, how the Tiger Got Its Stripes. How, how the Tiger Got Its Stripes. Is that, again, they're very solitary characters, uh, both the characters in your story. They're sort of uh, the Vietnamese lady as well as yes. this man who's sort of interacting with her. Um, and again, it reminds me of something that Frank O'Connor said, that, uh, and the title of his book bears that out, The Lonely Voice, that... Short stories lend themselves wonderfully to the figure on, on the outside, the loner, the romantic, the intransigent character. Um, uh, and I think that that's very true of Yuyun's stories also. They're very, very solitary characters, uh, you know, figures on, figures on the margins. Uh, but another thing that O'Connor says, and I'm sorry I'm quoting him so much because I think that's a, that's a wonderful book, uh, is that there is nothing necessarily in the short story that demands that the short story be short. You know, you could have a very, very long story, as, lo as long as a novel, but it could still be quintessentially a short story. And I think it was, it was Frank O'Connor uh, who talked about Ulysses, the novel Ulysses, as a very long short story, because it just happens over one day. So there's something about sh the short story which is not just about length, uh, but more about the kind of characters, the, ca the way time flows in the story, the focus on the present. Uh, and I want to ask Yoon about the first story in her book, mm -hmm. which is a really long story. It's, it's more like a novella, uh, but it's perfectly at home in this, in this collection, Gold Boy, Emerald Girl, because uh, her character there, uh, Moyan, uh, is, very, is in some ways, uh, in sensibility, very similar to the other characters. And it doesn't matter at all that this is a story many times longer than the other stories. Uh, Yoon, would you like to comment on that? Right, I, you know, I think sometimes I think the story decides how much you want to, you know, how much space the story needs. And, and that particular story came to me because, you know, I, I like to think about writing as a conversation with other writers or with books. So William Trevor, you know, the Irish short story master, he's, he's really my, you know, I think he's my hero. So oftentimes I think I write stories to talk to his stories. And you're right, the first story, I actually chose one of his novellas. He, doesn't, he didn't write a lot of novellas. He, he wrote two novellas. One of them is called The Night at Alexandra. Again, I thought, you know, for a short story master, he would choose, you know, the novella form, 100 pages, to tell a provincial Irish man's story about, you know, started, I am, I am 48, I am a provincial, I am, I'm not, have never married. So I thought that's a very interesting novella and I thought, you know, I'm just going to write a story to talk to that novella and see where that would get me. So I started my, I started kindness with the same sentence cadence, you know, I am, a, I'm 41, I have never married. I live by myself where I've never had children. I can't, I can't remember. But I think, in a way, I think once this character started to have the conversation with a character from another story, this character really carried on more than I decide how the story should be written or how long the story should be. So it's very natural. It came to 100 pages, about the same length as, as Trevor's novella. And I look back and I thought, yes, I think that's exactly what I need because I don't want to make it into a novel. And, but it's not a story that could be contained in 20 pages. So I just decided to keep it as it is. Would it be a problem if you were publishing it in a magazine? Because uh, is there, is there this idea that if you're publishing a story in a magazine, it has to be 3,000 words or 5,000 words, and you're constrained by yeah. the word limit? It is, you know, practically speaking, it's really hard to practice a novella because I, I really like that 
story or novella. I really liked it, and I sent it to the New Yorker, and my editor really liked it too. And she said, the thing is, if I excerpt it, it's going to lose the strength. And I said, I understand. So in the end, I published with another magazine, which actually would publish longer piece of fiction, but there are not many magazines would publish this. But, you know, but I think that's for practical consideration. And I would not want to lose the strength of that story just to sure. get into the New Yorker. Mm. So, sure. so I, I think, yeah, so I, I think in the end, it, I, I, I'm very happy about the length of that story. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Richard, you're, you're also the director of the National Academy of Writing. Uh, so you're probably exposed to contemporary writing in Britain, what young people are writing, what other kind of forms and <coughs> themes that are of particular interest. What would you say is the state of the short story in Britain today? Who are the best short story writers? Is anyone writing arresting short stories other than you? Hmm. <laughs> um, I think there are... Uh, and Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrible question to ask, really. Um, you mean I, I you think the, the short story form has, has um, uh, been in a, a condition of, of, of uh, revival for some time. Um, it wasn't so long ago that it was thought that it was easier to, to say to aspiring writers it was easier to sell a novel than a short story. Um, these days, there are more and more outlets for short stories, maybe connected to... Uh, the shorter attention span that we have because we're looking at screens all the time. Um, and of course those stories themselves get shorter and shorter. But I think that the short story has, has now seen its popularity increase both for the writers and for readers, um, which can only be uh, a good thing for people who like writing short stories. I think there are some excellent Irish short story writers at the moment. Um, and it always seems to have fitted the Irish voice there is a, um, a lyricism and a ludic, playful quality to a lot of Irish writing which suits the form. And the Irish voice comes off, uh, across very strongly. I would particularly recommend uh, Kevin Barry, who uh, won the Sunday Times Short Story Prize last year, uh, and also a more experimental writer called Keith Ridgway, who's also very strong in the form of the short story. Okay. Um, I think we will have to wind up and ask audience questions, but I quickly want to ask Nicholas one last question. Uh, you said, Nicholas, that ideally uh, you would just write short stories. Uh, will that ever happen? Will you? What does it take to stand up and say, I love writing short stories and everything else be damned, I'm going to be a short story writer? Uh, money. <laughs> And, and time. The, the thing is, it's very hard. You, you could aim, you could be a short story writer and perhaps aim at prizes to try and sustain your career as purely a short story writer. But uh, that's pretty unrealistic, no matter how good you are, I think. I, Yuyun Lee has done very well. <laughs> but um, it, it's, it's, it's tough to, to make a proper amount of money. And one, one project I set up to, to try and make money for short story writers a couple of years ago was having huge photographs combined, having a short story write, writer write in response to a photo. Then we took the text and combined it into a single image, a typograph, which we then sold to people. And we had Sachi and Sachi had them up. And they're, they're a wonderful, wonderful way and a, a different approach to try and generate income from short stories. And it worked, but there's a, there was a 700 word limit, which is quite short to write to. But. So if you're, if you're making your living from writing, you can't just do short stories? Um, it, it, it would be very tough. It depends how, how you want to live your life. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe you could teach English as a foreign language. Um, yeah, that's not a bad way. Not a bad way of making some money too, but... Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, should we go to questions or? I yeah. think it's about that time. I yeah. think we have a question just here and then we'll do one over that side. We'll, we'll coordinate, madam. How short should be a short story to be called a short story? Yeah. Uh, how short should a be short. a short story to be called a short story? Uh, we just discussed that a little bit, the question of length. Uh, but Yoon, would you like, would you like to say? <laughs> 
I mean, I would say, you know, usually people would say 3,000 words to 5,000 words, but I think it doesn't matter, you know, in a way. I think, you know, one, one very good short story writer in America is Eudora Welty, and many of her stories were just two or three pages long. And when, when people asked her why her stories were so short, she said, because I, <laughs> she, she said she was a very lovely lady. She said, well, just not to be nice, I think I could achieve in two or three pages what people achieve you know, in the novel. So, so I think, you know, she decided two pages is enough, and I, it is enough, it's, so. The, yeah, there's the, the, the very famous Hemingway short story about, Six I think words. it's uh, Red Baby Shoes Never Worn. For, oh, for sale, for baby sale, shoes never worn. Never worn. It, yeah, I, I always teach that story uh-huh. <laughs> in, my, in my short story class. We have um, a question on the there, yeah. left here. You have said, uh, a conflict between a teacher and a, a story writer or fiction writer. Uh, one has to be a bad teacher. What, what actually do you mean? I mean why should you be a bad teacher? For why should you be a bad teacher in order to be a good writer? Oh, this, is, this is to do with uh, James Joyce. Yeah. Um, well, James Joyce is, is really not a very good model for people. He's so, <laughs> so unique. Um, and it is true that his grammar is dreadful in Finnegan's Wake, and it, it requires correcting. And I think a lot of people would... I think there'd be a market if there are any publishers in the audience for a corrected version of Finnegan's Wake, which was comprehensible. Um, but, but it's really to do with the, that... Um, conflict between wanting to devote as much time as possible to writing to be as good at writing as you can be and needing to make a a living which uh, Nick referred to as well Uh, and the feeling is that someone like James Joyce he had to teach English in order to write but in fact when you look closely at his biography at the non-fiction side of that story he was a truly dreadful teacher and that probably helped him along because he felt he was using all his useful energy for the writing so it's not a rule that you do have to be a bad teacher. And, and if anyone is doing a job and writing at the same time, it's, it's not a piece of advice. It was just an observation for the story. And it doesn't follow if you're a bad teacher that you will be a genius writer. Well. Absolutely. <laughs> that, that is part of the story as well. He does <laughs> see if he can follow James Joyce in every way in order to become a better writer. Okay. Hi, Andrew. First, I would like to, uh, especially since we ended on that somewhat gloomy note of having to write novels in order to survive, <laughs> I'd like to um, uh, acknowledge that you mildly scoffed nicely at the idea that the short story is dying. So, um, I have two questions, actually. Uh, one of them is to Yoon, and a lot of the time uh, we agonize here in India about language and about uh, how to incorporate different uh, nuances and languages into your writing. And uh, do you think about that a great deal, or are you really writing in a different world? Um, yeah. and, and maybe I'll just ask the second. And yeah. then the second one was, um, I run a short story magazine called Out of Print, and I noticed that a lot of the writing that we get is, um, doesn't conform to the idea of show and tell, and not just because of a lack of craft, a show versus tell, not just because of a lack of craft, but I sometimes think it's a cultural thing that you know, people still grow up listening to the epics, there's a narrator, and so there's a, there's, a, uh, there's a different model almost sometimes to short stories that we get. And so the idea that you're experimenting with form uh, does that come entirely from within your own heads, or are you uh, nodding to some other kind of um, classical forms, is what I wanted to ask. Well, I'll start with the language. You know, I, I mean, I've, of course, I write in English, which is my second language, and, and I have a very interesting relationship with this, my written language, because I've never written in Chinese, so English actually is my first language in writing. and. And I think, but of course, you know, the disadvantage for me is I did not grow up with the language, so I would never achieve the intimacy with the language as a native speaker would have by, you know, by nature. But I wouldn't worry about that because, you know, I think partly I, I overcome that by just reading. And I think that that's one thing. The other part is, I, I think it, it, writing has a lot to do with music. And once you get into the music of the language, the cadence of the language, you know, you really get to get a hand of it really fast. So, 
So I don't worry about language so much. But I do agree with you that you know the the, the cultural the cultural part. Because people would ask me, you know, how do you write? How do you write a Chinese situation into English? And my Chinese characters actually their dialogues are in English. And so I think there is a difference between translating their dialogues versus translating the situations. And there are a lot of situations, you know, you probably have that in India and in China, that to the Western audience, you do have to translate the situations for them for a little bit. So for those situations, I think, you know, I minimize the translation because you don't want to dictate your readers. You don't want to overcome, you know, you don't want to be a cultural ambassador. So I do just, I, I just trickle a little bit into it and I think, you know, readers can pick up again. They can pick up those things. Mm. Uh, Richard, would you like to respond? Yeah, about the um, experimentation. Uh, I think if you approach a story um, thinking that you're going to be an experimental, you want to approach it experimentally as an experimental writer, it means you're deliberately not following a classical model. One of the problems with following a classical model, you'll always be a follower and not a leader, not an innovator. Um, so that can lead to over-familiar types of writing. But there is also a tradition of experimental writing, so you can have a classical sense of experimentalism. Um, George Perec, who I mentioned, for example, he was part of a group called the Ulipo in, uh, in, in Paris in the 1970s. And they have constraints which force you to write in a different way. For example, I wrote one story which is called Story Without Verbs, and it's just a story which has no verbs in it. And the advantage of the experimentation is that it forces you to find new forms of expression, and so the story looks new. But the other advantage, which I think you were referring to, is it means that necessarily you avoid familiar errors or the story looking familiar. So it has both of those advantages. But there is a traditional experimentalism, so you're not entirely on your own the whole time. Um, OK, I think we have a question on the left here. We'll try to get to everybody, except we, we have limited time. Unfortunately, yeah. Yi Yun has another um, yeah. session well, um, to go to. I'm, I'm wondering if short story will be dead, uh, because unlike novels, uh, which, which, we, which we know uh, hasn't died, the form has evolved. And uh, though we talk that the, uh, the, uh, the short stories allow uh, experiments with style, but uh, uh, the form of novel is co uh, continuously evolving because it allows uh, a lot of space for narrator and characters to, uh, you know, just grow into it. So, uh, because of the uh, structure's limitation, would eventually, uh, besides some experimentation, uh, will stru uh, short story will be eventually be completely, you know, explode the, the, the aesthetics of the form, basically, the structure. Uh, okay, that doesn't sound like a question, but more like a comment. No, I, th I, th I think oh, it does. Okay. Yeah, I don't think short stories, because how we tell stories, we tell short stories, we don't tell each other novels in conversation. So when we tell an anecdote, when we tell something that happened to us, something that you heard about happened to your friend, this is a short story. And by writing it down, you crystallize it, you really, really focus it and make it perhaps better than an oral telling. So I, I, I don't, short stories will always exist as long as people exist and as long as we talk to each other and look for ways of defining our lives. We, we don't speak novels to each other, but we do tell short stories to each other. Okay, we have another question over here. Um, yeah. So my question is, uh, the short story, I guess, to an extent is still existent, but what about the fictionality of fiction? How do we say the sanctity of that? Because um, a lot of times during the session you spoke about how your fiction is sort of stemming, your short stories, sorry, are stemming from non-fictional real life events. And even though they may be fictionalized, they again lose the sanctity of being completely non-fiction or completely fiction. So how do we save that? How do you save the sanctity of fiction? Um, yeah, I, my answer to that would be that uh, there's so many things involved in writing a short story. and. The question of whether it's based on fact or not is only part of the whole thing. Then there is um, structure. How do you structure these different elements into a story? How do you write dialogue? Uh, how do you use language? All of that goes into telling a story. And in the end, whether this actually happened or not uh, can actually become quite marginal. Because the reality that you're left with are those words on the page. So for me, the sanctity of fiction is about the sanctity of imagination. If you can keep the imagination alive, 
it doesn't really matter whether the story you're telling happened or not. Uh, the, uh, the strength of imagination often is to uh, write about things that you don't know yourself or haven't experienced yourself. Uh, but that's only one test. If they did happen to you, how do you retell them? So you know, there's so many elements, and it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be reduced to, is this true or, or did you make this up? Because a lot more goes into creating a story than just that. That would be my answer. Do you want to respond? That sounds bad. Okay. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> I think I have we a have question here. time for one more question. Um, I have the microphone. If I can go ahead. Could I, you can stand I up? Oh, yes, standing ahead. up. Here, yes. right at the back. Oh, over there. Um, okay. I'd like to just so that maybe we could put it to bed or not, depending on your answers. But is the single effect datum and you know the more the poesque uh, tradition and the greater emphasis on uh, technique and on uh, like ma'am said there on on showing or on the iceberg that the, the hemingway metaphor is that now completely dated because for instance difficult pleasures um, i mean you in internal focalization could still provide for uh, an ultimate unique effect even though you know you're playing with silences you're incorporating white space. What's your comment on that? Anyone could pick it up. Um, yeah. What's the question again? Uh, the question is difficult. <laughs> uh, I, I think what you're saying is how much exposition and how much drama? What should be the balance uh, between exposition where you're actually just telling and drama where you're showing? That's what you're asking and you're saying in Difficult Pleasures, my book, I have a lot of silence and inner life and not necessarily so much drama, but are you saying I still, it's still okay? Yeah. <laughs> I, okay. I will pick that yeah. up because I, I notice because I also teach writing and my students come in and they all, they are all told show and not show, not tell. Mm. And I think that's the worst advice yeah. they have ever got. Yeah. I said, you know, yeah. you know, you cannot do that because we always say storyteller. We have never said story shower. You know, you can't really show a story. The, the, sh the beauty of short story is you can collapse time. You know, a character can live 50 years in one moment, and that, you know, needs sh telling. And if you read the masters, you know, if you read Chekhov, there are dra dramatic moments, but you cannot rely on dramatic moments. I think a lot, I mean, at least I, I observe my students, a lot of their dramas come from movies in Hollywood. And they think that's the storytelling, and I think that's the wrong way to go. As, um, I mean, James Salter is probably the master of showing and not telling. And uh, some beautiful stories. In Last Night, his, his most recent collection, there's some glittering shards in that collection. But occasionally, he doesn't tell you enough. Now, no matter how hard you're working as the reader, you're befuddled by a character that comes in, and you are not told enough about that character. It, but it feels ridiculous criticizing James Salter sitting here. But there's, a, there's just a couple of... I have such high expectations when I pick up his collections. And there are occasionally, perhaps he should come to one of your classes and uh, you tell James Salter that he should, he should oh. tell a little more. I do, I do. I yell at a lot of bad people. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think that's a good note on which to end the session. And I think we have to end the session now. But yeah, show sure, and not tell... Uh, maybe a good rule, but it's not, you know, it's not necessarily something you have to follow literally because a lot of good stories show you and we are story, uh, we are storytellers, not story showers. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you, you so much, everybody. A round of applause for our wonderful panel. Thank you. Ewan, thank you. Present from the festival. Okay, we've, fi we've had to finish this session a touch early. Um, Yi Yun does have to rush off, but hopefully our British authors, if they're open for a little bit of discussion, might be up to head towards the book signing table. Um, people, I'm sure, have there were many questions we didn't get to. I'm really sorry about that, everybody. We do do our best to try to get a cross-section. Okay, thank you so much. We'll see you at the next se session at 5 o'clock. <laughs>